today I get to preach about judgment. I've been waiting for this day for four years. But if you're expecting a sermon with lots of fire and brimstone, you have come to the wrong place. Because it turns out that God's judgment is not bad news at all. In fact, it is some of the very best news we can receive. So let us pray. God, we ask that by your Holy Spirit, we would take your word to us in Scripture today and plant it deeply within our hearts and cause it to grow and bear fruit in our lives for your kingdom. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. There are lots of parts of the Bible that talk about judgment. Today I have chosen to read from near the beginning of Paul's letter to the Romans. It's Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Paul says to his readers, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Again, this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. These days, judgment is a bad word, isn't it? Judgment. It just has this negative connotation to it. And in our culture today, it is regarded as a bad word everywhere we turn. Conversations with friends, media, news, TV shows, especially places like the comments section of Facebook. We encounter people insisting that they not be judged. They find judgment offensive. Don't judge me, they say. Who are you to judge? Or if they're more humble, who am I to judge? And my personal favorite is when people who don't believe in God don't identify as Christians, have never stepped foot inside of a church, have never cracked open a Bible, still love to take Jesus' words and throw them in the face of Christians. Jesus said, don't judge. So there, as if it's this kind of trump card. In our culture, judgment has practically become the eighth deadly sin. But that is not how judgment is seen in Scripture. Anyway, the entire witness of Scripture from beginning to end, which spans thousands of years, dozens of different writers in several different cultures, it all agrees that judgment is a good thing. <coughs> that God's judgment is a good thing. Our God is a judging God. It's part of God's character. It's part of who God is. And it's not a bad thing. It is a very good thing. And really, when you think about it, we already know that judgment at least can be a good thing. We, if we spend some time thinking about it, we already know this. I mean, we tell people, use good judgment. Right? We hope our kids will be good judges of character. And the kids they hang out with at school, or the, the people that they decide to go out with, or maybe marry someday, we hope they will be good judges in that respect. We, when we're going to make a big purchase, we go online and read the product reviews, right? We want to see what other people have judged about this product before we spend our money on it. Of course, many of our worst mistakes in life we can attribute to poor judgment. And even the hurtful judgments that we know about, when, when we see hurtful judgments being made on the basis of prejudice, stereotyping, fear, hate. The whole reason we don't like those judgments is because we have judged those judgments to be bad judgments. <coughs> right? I mean, without judgment, nothing can be good or bad. 
We could not condemn evil. We could not praise good. The entire concept of beauty wouldn't even exist without judgment. We would live in a kind of stale apathy, a neutrality in life, just this, this grayness. Judgment can be a very good thing. You know this. The only time judgment becomes a problem is when it gets mixed up with hypocrisy. Paul says to his readers in Rome, when you pass judgment on someone else, you're condemning yourself because you do the same things. <coughs> the Jewish Christians in Rome, the Jews that were there, they were judging the Gentiles. Remember, Gentiles just means everybody else that wasn't Jewish, that wasn't God's people. The Jews were judging the Gentiles as being worse than themselves, further away from God than themselves, greater sinners than themselves. Paul says, when you make that judgment on those Gentiles, it blows up back in your face because you are just as sinful as they are. You are just as sinful as they are. Hypocrisy. And this is what Jesus meant in Matthew 7, the scripture that Don read for us. He starts off by saying, do not judge, but that's not all he said in that passage. Jesus never teaches us not to judge. What he says is that your standard of judgment will be applied to you as well the minute you pronounce judgment on someone else. It gets applied to you. And the chances are you've got even bigger problems than the person you're judging. In fact, Jesus knows that our problems are just as big, if not bigger. Our sins are just as bad. We're just as separated from God by them. So basically, Jesus says, if you're going to judge, you better be awfully careful taking care to notice the log in your own eye. Then, he said, you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The speck in your brother's eye is a problem. We can judge that speck to be a problem. That's okay. In fact, not to do that, if we said, well, I'm not going to judge the speck in your eye, we would just be letting people walk around with stuff in their eye. <laughs> and that's not compassionate, that's not loving. In fact, it's functionally hateful saying, well, you've got a problem. I don't care. The loving thing is to judge that the speck is a problem after you have judged the log in your own eye to be a bigger problem. And then we can help compassionately remove the speck from our brother's eye. Judgment is not a sin. Hypocrisy is. So if judgment is a good thing, it's not a sin. God is a judging God. Judgment is, or at least can be, a good thing. What's so good about it? What is so good about God's judgment? What are its benefits? How does it work when it's working properly? This is what Paul wants to go on to explain. And he says the first benefit is that God's judgment tells the truth about who we are. God's judgment tells the truth about who we are. He says God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. When God judges something in our life or in our hearts to be sinful, he is, like I told the kids, always right. He's never wrong in his judgments. Now, we've got all sorts of creative ways to try and you know, dress up our behavior, make it look good, and rationalize what we do and what we don't do, but God sees through all of it right down to the naked truth. And the truth, by the way, is more than just a mere collection of facts. Okay, there, there's a pastor I heard about once who had a church member approach him after the service uh, to correct one of the illustrations he used, one of the facts that he quoted uh, for his illustration. He said, Pastor, that fact wasn't accurate. And pastor said, son, I'm a preacher. I'm interested in the truth. If I need facts, I'll make them up. Huh? <laughs> I've never ever done that with you. <laughs> the fact may be that you've never murdered anyone in your life. But the truth, Jesus says, is that anyone who is even angry with another person 
is going to be judged and sentenced in the exact same way as if they had. God doesn't just know what we've done. God knows why we've done it. He knows our intentions. He knows our hearts. God knows the truth about who we are. And the truth, according to God's judgment, is that the sin in you is also in me. And the sin in me is also in you. You who pass judgment do the same things, Paul says. Now, but wait a minute. We don't do the same things as some of those other people. Some of the people that we know who are in prison, the people that we see on the news, the people who are joining ISIS, we don't do those things. We're not beheading Christians in the Middle East. We don't do the same things. We're not selling drugs. We're not joining gangs. So what does Paul mean by saying you who pass judgment do the very same things? It means that the sin in them is also in you. The sin in you is also in me. The sin in me is also in you. The sin that leads them to do the things that they are doing is the same sin that leads you and me to do the things that we do. And to fail to do the things that we ought to do. The sin that causes one man to steal from his neighbor causes another man to ignore his neighbor. Sin that causes one woman to join a gossip session causes another young woman to join a gang. The symptoms are different, but the disease is the same. Sin in you is also in me. Sin in me is also in you. In other words, we are all of us guilty, period. That sounds sad and like bad news, right? That's actually the second benefit that I want to mention today of God's judgment. Which is that God's judgment puts all of us in the same boat. God's judgment puts all of us in the same boat. From the worst sinner to the best saint, from Mother Teresa to Adolf Hitler, we are all in the same boat. God's judgment, as Paul goes on to say, is that we are all sinners. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In our passage today, do you think that you will escape God's judgment? Do you think that just because some people seem more sinful than you, that you're not in the same boat? That you can escape God's judgment while they get it? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, some fall shorter than others. But the point is, we are all fallen. That is God's judgment. It is that we are all sinners, which is the truth, and that puts all of us in the same boat. Which leads us to the third benefit of God's judgment, and that is repentance. Now remember, the word repent just means to turn around. To turn around, to go in a different direction, and only when we realize that we're all in the same boat, and that that boat is headed for going over a waterfall, only then do we realize, hey, I want to turn around. Hey, I need to turn around. I've got a problem. I'm in this boat with everybody else. We discover our need to repent and go in a different direction. Paul says, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? What does Paul mean by God's kindness is intended to lead us to repentance? Well, God has shown us kindness by postponing our sentence, giving us a chance to repent. The verdict has already come in. We're standing in the courtroom. We're on the stand. The jury has read the verdict, and it is guilty for all of us. And yet God has kindly postponed sentencing so that we have a chance to repent. He's given us time to repent, time to turn around. And if we use that time by acting hypocritically and saying, okay, thanks, judge, for not sentencing me, and then we go out and start judging other people, you horrible sinners, forgetting that we are guilty ourselves, we are showing contempt for God's kindness. God's kindness, the 
time that he gives us, the postponement in that sentencing, is meant to lead us to repentance. And of course, when we repent, the only place that we have to turn is toward Jesus Christ. Repentance doesn't mean, well, you go get your life in order by yourself. If that's all it is, that's bad news because we can't do it. We can't get out of the boat on our own. So the place that we turn, the place we repent, is always and only toward Jesus Christ. It is only the blood of Jesus Christ that is sufficient to rescue us from this boat that we're in. To wash away the sin in our hearts. Jesus is our only option for salvation. And he is where God's judgment has been leading us all along. This is one of the bigger points that Paul is trying to make in the book of Romans. That God's whole point in judging us as guilty is to eventually lead us to Jesus Christ. Because without God's judgment, we wouldn't know that we were guilty. We wouldn't know that we were sinners, so we would not know that we need to repent, and we would not turn toward Christ, and we would not be saved. So you see how that progression works? If there's no judgment, we are not saved. God's judgment saves us. It saves us from our sin. It saves us from ourselves. It saves us from a world that is broken and in desperate need of repair. And none of that could happen without God's judgment. So it's no wonder that the psalm that was our call to worship this morning ends by saying that all creation rejoice, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. You ever heard somebody talking about rejoicing because of God's judgment? And yet that's exactly what the psalmist was doing. God's judgment is a good thing. It's a sign of his love for us. Asking God not to judge us is asking God not to love us. God who does not judge is like a doctor who does not diagnose. Who cannot do anything to heal, cannot do anything to save. Our God is a judging God. And we thank God that He is. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.